morning. Thanks for being here today. To start today, I'd like to I'd like for you to imagine with me uh, a couple. We'll just give fictitious names. So, uh, a parents, Michael and Samantha, and they have this son, Braden. And again, if those are your names, that is totally uh, not intentional. But let's just imagine, and they're having a conflict with their son. And it's a normal kind of conflict. Maybe it's uh, he's a teenager, and maybe it's his grades. Maybe it's um, staying out too late or an attitude they don't like or something, but they're having this conflict. And regardless of what the conflict is, how this situ- situation plays out is going to depend not just on the details of the conflict itself, but particularly how the parents, Michael and Samantha, how they frame this situation in their minds. So for example, they could think about this conflict with Raiden in financial terms. This image of that they're thinking about this conflict and they're thinking about whether they've invested much time into him and and if they're gonna require him to do something he doesn't wanna do, that they recognize that's a withdrawal from the bank account of their investment. They could think of it in those categories. They could also think about this conflict with their son in terms of war or a battle, that somebody has to win this, and either they're gonna win or he's gonna win. They can also think about it in terms of tree growth. That they can think about Braden as a tree that is growing, and that as something grows over time and development, there are different needs at different times. With a, with a tree at first, you would stake it down and maybe wrap it to, to guide it in a certain way, but over time, you have to unwrap it. And over time, you have to take the stakes away so that it can grow in a healthy way. Or they could think about this conflict as a story, that their lives are a story, his life is a story, and how they respond to this conflict and how they relate to him is going to affect what role their characters are gonna play in the rest of his life story that'll go beyond them. And you see, in each of these ways, The parents, Michael and Samantha, they can frame the relationship and each of these are a metaphor. Each of these are an image, they are a frame, they're an analogy that's smashed up to this situation. And regardless of these different metaphors, whether it's financial or war or growth story, they're gonna deeply affect what happens in this situation. Because you see, the conflict that's happening, the data points, those are out there and those are a real thing But what happens and how it plays out, how they feel about it, how he feels about it, is not just the data, it's not just the situation, it's actually the framing of how they think about it. And often, we aren't even aware of these framing metaphors. You may just think of a situation you're in and you just think this is the only way to think about it, But that framing metaphor that you probably got, you did get from probably past experiences, something implicitly or explicitly, that's affecting how you interpret the situation. And friends, this is the power of frames. This is the power of metaphors because it's, they are not just merely analogies or illustrations, they're actually ways of seeing. Different metaphors, different images enable us to see things in a certain way. And maybe again, you've always thought of something in a certain way and then what happens? In fact, I would suggest to you, this is even what conversion is. (laughs) It's coming to see the same things about yourself and God and others in a different way. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is not because I'm gonna preach a message on biblical parenting or something or metaphor theory, which is interesting, but because I want us to be thinking about what Jesus does, particularly in Luke chapter six, the text we're gonna look at, but also more generally, how he is constantly reframing our understanding of ourselves and of God by giving us images that are again, not merely illustrations. They're not merely analogies. They are actually ways of seeing that you may not have seen before. Just like with Michael and Samantha in this conflict with their son. And so we're gonna look at Luke chapter six, starting in verse 43. And at this point in Luke, this is, Uh, you know, about a third of the way or a fourth of the way through the book or so. And this is in and following and and part of, it's really the conclusion of what we often call the Sermon on the Plain and that it started back in 620. 
And so far before this, Jesus has been talking, really challenging things about money and challenging things about prayer and showing mercy to our enemies. There's a lot of powerful things in here. And he brings this Sermon on the Plain to a conclusion by talking in terms of two really powerful metaphors. These are key ways that Jesus wants us to think about our lives and think about the world. And it's through this clarifying these, these metaphors, these images that he is inviting us to see differently. So let me start with the first of these, the tree and fruit. Let me read for you Luke 6, verses 43 to 45. Jesus said, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, you don't have to read very far in the Bible to see trees and fruit are all over the place. I mean, really, right from the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, you see some really important trees that are there, and trees that are meant to be fruitful and multiply, and that even Adam and Eve are commanded that. Genesis chapter three, the whole tragic story is told through the lens of a tree whose fruit Adam and Eve eat in disobedience to God. Psalm one, this crucial psalm, this wisdom psalm that begins the Psalter, a wisdom psalm that paints a picture of two different kinds of agricultural situations, chaff that just gets blown away versus a tree that's fruitful. We could look at other places, Matthew chapter three, John the Baptist, challenges the religious leaders of his day that although they have all the trappings of faith, they are not actually bearing fruit. John 15, you can think of that, Jesus' famous teaching of the necessity of abiding in him because he is tending to us and the Father is the vine dresser. Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul speaks about that how do you tell the difference if he was a Christian or not? He uses a tree and fruit metaphor, the fruit of the Spirit versus the deeds of the flesh. Revelation 22, the story of the Bible ends where it begins with this picture of tree and the tree of life, bringing healing to the nations and feeding. This is an important metaphor. This is not just a one-off thing. This is a big image in the Bible. And I think Jesus' point is pretty clear to us that, that peach trees produce peaches, grapevines produce grapes, olive bushes produce olives. The Caribbean Machanil tree, the world's most poisonous tree, produces the manzanilla de la muerte, the little apple of death, if you eat it. A, f a healthy tree will produce healthy fruit and an unhealthy or dead tree will produce malformed or no fruit at all. And in verse 45, he slightly changes the image, doesn't he? But the point is still the same. He uses a treasure house because the point is the same that What's inside of us, health or unhealth, goodness or bad, sooner or later will come out. It will reveal itself over time. Now, it's always good to remember this is a universal principle, but you always have to remember too, even good people, and we all make mistakes. We say and do dumb things. So you can't make it a sort of 100%, like any bad thing equals a total evil heart, but it's a general principle that's true that sooner or later, even though we all stumble and fall, our true nature will be revealed. Then look at the next metaphor he gives in verse 46. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and he laid the foundation on a rock and when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation, and when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. House, that's another pretty important image or metaphor throughout the Bible, or building. You can think of the tabernacle, you can think of the temple in Jerusalem, of course, you can think of the home and the central role that the home plays in, in developing and passing on the faith. In the New Testament, the temple 
and the home become images of very important ways to describe what the church is, the household of God, where we're brothers and sisters, the gathering of Christ's people, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. First Peter describes us being a spiritual house being built together that we might be a, a royal priesthood. All of these images play on the same idea that buildings and houses are an important way to think about our lives and to think about how our foundation determines our durability. And we've all heard stories and seen by pictures, I just saw one recently again, of people that have built these incredibly beautiful houses on the side of cliffs in California or somewhere, and as much as they might think Mother Nature won't win, the ocean always wins eventually, right? And you see these houses on the brink of disaster, we've all seen that happen. And it may be, or a tornado comes through, or some kind of hurricane comes through, not just natural erosion, but can also happen in a more subtle way. I remember a few years ago, I was, our house was probably over 50 years old, and I noticed, I think the, the gutters must have gotten clogged, et cetera, and I noticed some, in the brickwork, some separations, some cracks that worried me. And sure enough, it turns out some water had been, you know, the, the gutters were clogged, just a small thing, had some leaves in there, and then the water wasn't flowing out, and so it was seeping down and got down to the foundation, and it took a long time, it was very, it took probably years for it to happen, it began to cause this breakdown of the foundation. Now, I'm not a foundation expert or an architect, but it's not very difficult to see how that happens in our lives as well. That it may be a big hurricane, it may be you know, building a house by the ocean, but probably for most of us, the idea of foundation erosion is something that happens slow and over time. And I think this is what Jesus is getting at as well. And so, two images, really short, just a few verses here. What's Jesus saying? with these? Like how, why is this the ending to this famous Sermon on the Plain? Well, I, wanna, I just wanna ask two questions to help us think about that. The first is just that, like what is he saying? And then the second is, what are we supposed to do with this? So the first question, what, what is he saying with these metaphors? Did you notice or ever considered how these two metaphors that seem very different, fruit and tree, foundation of house, do you notice how they're actually connected to each other and they're in some ways saying the same thing, that our internal person, our character again, is eventually revealed by our lives. A tree's health is eventually revealed by the kind of fruit it produces or lack thereof. Sometimes it takes time. R.T. France, the, the gospel scholar, describes the time when he was living in West Africa and when he couldn't tell for a long time the difference between a banana plant and a plantain one. And if you haven't had Takaluchador's plantains, they will change your life. But that, he couldn't tell. And so he asked a botanist who answered that actually you can't tell until it starts to produce fruit. They look the same. And I think that's true. It, it just takes time sometimes to see. And, and Jesus is saying the heart, the interior person is shown through the mouth or the quality of the foundation is eventually shown through the response to the rains. And I think Jesus wants us to pay attention always to the health of our souls, what kind of tree we are and whether we are diseased or thriving or full of flowing sap and vitality. Because a healthy tree over time imperfectly will in season produce fruit, but there's always a temptation, especially those of us all of us who are to some degree, you know, connected with ministry and, and theological education, it's really easy, as one scholar points out, to stop being a fruit tree and instead to just be a Christmas tree. If you think about what a Christmas tree is, it, it looks good. In fact, it's maybe kind of even prettier initially than a fruit tree. It's got tinsel on it or something and it's got lights on it and it's exciting, but it's actually in the process of dying. It's already been cut off. It doesn't have a root system anymore, and it is, looks really good, but it will only take a matter of time if it's a live tree, not an artificial tree. If it's a live tree, to, it turns out it's actually just a Christmas tree, or maybe we say a Christian tree, instead of an actual fruit tree that's rooted. I was in Oklahoma the last several days, and just yesterday I was driving, I was way out in western Oklahoma, driving back to Oklahoma City to catch my plane. 
And they've had recently, again, a lot of wildfires, but in years past as well. And I remember when I was out there just a few months ago as well, they have these large sections, you know, it's beautifully desolate in Oklahoma, just big fields, you know, of rolling and flat areas. And they have large sections where there are all these trees that oak trees that look so weird because they are, you know, they were once thriving and they're all standing there, but they have no leaves and they're all grayed out. And the reason is, is because these wildfires that had come through were so hot that they killed the trees. Like even these mighty oaks couldn't handle it. If it's a cedar, it actually boils the sap and they often explode. But the oaks, they, it kills them. It was just too high heat. But the winds were going so fast that it didn't have time to burn it up. So it's this very odd thing when you drive by them. There's all these standing dead trees. And it's hard not to think about our own lives, people we might see, and of course, more thinking about ourselves, not more than others ways in which that can happen with us. And so too, with rock versus clay, Kenneth Bailey points out that in the Middle East, it's very tempting when building a house to avoid the, the laborious work, this is what Jesus is referring here, of, of digging down to the, to the level of rock because you have all this clay, and especially if you're building in the summer, the clay is hard and it looks great. It's, I could build a house here, but when the season, the rainy season comes, that what seemed like a good foundation just becomes this chocolatey soup and anything you build on it is destroyed. So what's Jesus saying with these metaphors? He's inviting us to reframe our understanding of ourselves and to pay attention to what's on the inside. And it's so easy to not do that, especially when you're getting lots of praise for your skills and gifts and just in the stresses of life as well, it's really easy just to kind of constantly externalize and to not pay attention to what's going on because especially when you look inside, there, there's gonna be some shame, there's gonna be some embarrassment, there's gonna be some inconsistency, there's gonna be regrets, and those things are hard to pay attention to. And it's easier just to kind of say, I'm not gonna pay attention to that, that's overwhelming to me, and we might put really spiritual language on it, like, you know, glory of the Lord, joy, which are good things, but not if we're not paying attention to the inside. And in both of these metaphors, this is really what matters, is that the foundation, the thing you may not see, the interior, the sap, and the inside, that's what God sees and cares about. Because sooner or later, that is who we will become. And when you think about what the good things are, say, for example, producing the abundance and these things coming out, these are the things that Jesus has been teaching, loving our enemies, not condemning or misjudging those around us, being a good neighbor. All these things that Jesus is commending to us and he wants to make sure that we are being honest about what's going on inside. So I think that's the focus of these metaphors. That's the first question, what he's asking. And then I think the question that comes naturally from that is then what do we do with this? Well, this morning I, I wanna give you a loving challenge, and uh, I hope a hope-giving encouragement. Here's the loving challenge. Remember that with these wise words, if you look at 46 and following, the wise and foolish builders, they both hear what Jesus says. And there were lots of people that heard what Jesus says. What's the difference between the wise person and the, pers and the foolish person? It's not actually in the hearing, it's in the doing or the response. Some people in the crowd around Jesus heard what he said and acted upon it, and others heard it but didn't, but maybe they still kind of hung around, and so too, of course, with us in this room and in our churches, that there are many who are hearing but not really responding. It's very possible to be involved in the Christian world and not really respond from the heart. So here's the challenge related to that, the loving challenge. I didn't challenge you to put your hand on the rudder of the sailboat of your life. And here's what I mean by that. If you think about your life with three possible boats, one boat would be a raft, one would be a sailboat, and one would be like a galley ship, like a rowing ship. 
Because we believe and trust in Jesus that he's real and that he's inviting us into the flourishing life, what he's inviting us to do, I think, is to live as a sailboat. And what do I mean by that? If we live as a raft, we live our lives as if we're just a victim of our circumstances and, and maybe my problems or other people's problems are caused by other people or, or maybe you put a theological frame on it that God's sovereign so I can't really change anything or do anything. That's living as a raft where you're just kind of floating around and really out of control. On the other end would be a galley ship where you think, well, now that I've heard the gospel, I need to work hard and become a really godly person by my self-discipline. And, and uh, you know, of course, that's not what trees do. <laughs> Either they don't work hard to produce fruit in that sense, but we just think about rowing. But what if you thought about your life instead like a sailboat, that our work is not to just kind of float, nor is it to just kind of try to be the hardest worker we can, but to turn the sails of your soul and your heart toward the wind of God and let him guide you and fill you, take responsibility to not close up the sails, but also recognize you can't make yourself more godly apart from the power of his breath, his spirit. And I think the vision of this is really said well by Dallas Willard who said that this is, that the gospel is, is effort, but it's not about earning. How Willard said it is, he says, grace is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. That is, it's not saying that we, you and I, need to just do a bunch of moral stuff to acquire a relationship with God, that's not the gospel. But neither is Jesus saying by these metaphors and the metaphor I'm giving you of boats, he's, he's neither is saying that what we do is irrelevant. He's not saying that our choices, our words, our habits, our decisions don't matter, they do because they shape us, they shape our now and our future. Jesus is telling us that contrary to our natural tendencies, we do need to pay attention to our character and the choices we make do shape us to be a certain kind of person. Legalism would command us to work hard and do a bunch of moral things. The gospel invites us by the power of the Spirit to become a different kind of people. And so our work is to open ourselves to God. I love how the Christian musician Sarah Grove said it. This is grace, an invitation to be beautiful. That is to open ourselves to God and the power of the Spirit. And how does that happen? Well, our, our character is formed and transformed through action. We don't learn how to be a great violinist or a race car driver or a golfer by just thinking about it or just going to country clubs or going to NASCAR racetracks. We actually have to open ourselves and seek to develop character. But just be aware that that's not an effort to earn God's favor. It's in opening ourselves to God's spirit. What you do matters. How you respond matters. But beware of the either side of the raft or the galley ship. Open yourself to God and his transforming work. And here's the, that's the loving challenge. Here's the encouragement. Every Christian can do this sailboat work that Jesus is talking about here in verses 43 to 49. That is, our tendency is to think that this kind of you know, great righteousness and bearing fruit, when we think of fruit, I think we tend to think of it as like flashy gifts and great abilities and the people who are really good at school and maybe really good at public speaking or whatever it is. But, no matter where you are today or what God will end up calling you to do, whether it's an accountant or a you know, teacher of some sort or whatever it is, the call of the gospel is a call to inner work, not to flashy fruit. In other words, we could take this fruit idea and make it seem that, oh, these are these great gifts, these great talents, but God's not impressed or unimpressed by your titles or your income or your talents, he always cares about your inner person. That's what these metaphors are doing. They're constantly pushing us back to say, the great looking house on the outside, the healthy looking tree, what really matters is the inside. And that looks like faithfulness in marriage, it looks like responding in mercy and compassion toward others in needs. It, it, need. it looks like loving your enemies, not judging or condemning them, it looks like private prayer, even if your words aren't very eloquent, if you don't feel like you're a very good prayer. 
So I, just, I wanna encourage you that whenever we hear Jesus' pretty strong words, which these are, you need to hear them in the context of what he's trying to do. He's trying to reshape us to think about what's really going on in our inner lives. Because a humble and contrite and broken spirit, he will not despise. Just a couple of weeks ago, I, our, six, our six kids are gone now, and I don't mean gone, like gone, but they're not in the house anymore. And we, uh, there's only one that doesn't live in town and we spend a lot of time together, but I, I, my wife and I were cleaning some stuff up and I found this little, uh, little drawing from one of our kids from quite a few years ago. And I you know, won't you know, reveal who it is or something, but the point is that it really struck me with a lot of regret. Like I just, it just reminded me of many years ago with that particular kid who was a really good kid. And I was just, I think I was too harsh with him. And it was revealed in this little thing that he had written in a little journal that he forgot about and drew a little picture. And it just, it crushed me. I mean, and what do you, so what do you do with that? What do you do with regret? What do you do with guilt? What do you do with shame? What you don't do with it is just double down on flashy exterior gifts. What you do is you're reminded what Jesus is saying here that he sees and cares about the inner person and that a broken and contrite heart he will not despise. This is the consistent theme throughout the Old and New Testament. God sees and cares about who you are on the inside. And to wrap this up, I just want to say that with these metaphors, they're, again, they are not tree and fruit and building house, they're not merely analogies. They also are gifts to us because Jesus' choice to use these images also encourages us that what he cares about is that we truly find life. As he says, that we might, you might have life and have it abundantly. Because if you think about these images, these metaphors, a tree bearing fruit that you can eat of, and I mean, if you had a perfectly ripe you know, piece of fruit, or a house that's solidly built that is warm and protects you, these images are not just analogies, they are invitations for us to remember that God wants you to flourish. The flourishing of the world is not the flourishing of the kingdom, but he does care about you eating of good things and living in security. And that's found not by all the ways the world says or all the flashy things, but by doing the interior work of saying to God, what kind of tree am I? Make me a healthy tree. What kind of foundation is in my heart? Make me that person by the power of the spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, our Father, that you are very kind and that you look upon us with joy, that you rejoice over your people with singing. And we confess, we know that there are parts of our lives that are dark and inconsistent and um, things that we're blind to. And we thank you that you have set a covenant love upon us and we pray that today in my heart and all of our hearts that you would, by the power of the Spirit, bring light and bring healing and bring strength and bring renewal in our inner people. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.